up to 1 Timothy. We're in chapter 6 now. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Verses 1 through 10 of this chapter. Originally, this was planned to be different messages, but the more I studied and more I looked at there's one theme in these verses. And so I would hate to separate this. I want us to take this all together. And the theme really, as we continue on, about how we honor one another and how we love unto the Lord. There was that honor of the elders and of widows. And now we begin to see instructions for how we are to put godliness on display. And this is a difficult section to start with. In these first couple of verses, we see all who are under the yoke as slaves are to regard their own masters as worthy of all honor. So that the name of God and our doctrine will not be spoken against. Those who have believers as their masters must not be disrespectful to them. Because they are brethren. But must serve them all the more. Because those who partake of the benefit are believers and beloved. Teach and preach these principles. So the first thing we see here is that we are to display a godly attitude. Even in situations that are unwelcome. Situations that we would not necessarily seek to be true of ourselves. No one wants to be a slave. No one likes to talk about slavery. In fact, there's a lot. If you open up your web browser and begin to search the Bible and slavery, you'll find all sorts of things. Much of which just isn't true or biblical. But there's a lot of people who talk about how the Bible never condemns slavery. And what I would say to them is that they haven't really dealt rightly with the passages about slavery. And we don't have time this morning to look at all of those things. We have talked about slavery in the past. As we've made our way through other books of the Bible, we've dealt with slavery. But just briefly to remind you that slavery in the ancient Roman world was not identical to slavery in early American days. In fact, much of the world today believes that America is the one who has perpetrated the great evils of slavery. And that was a part of our early history. But it wasn't necessarily the beginning, or the beginnings, I should say, weren't necessarily here in America. Even American slavery, as it's called, found its roots in African slavery, in European slavery, and particularly with the selling of one another by own countrymen. Africans selling Africans, wrong. To own anybody, wrong, amen? We believe that wholeheartedly. And we don't think the Bible tries to whitewash, if you will, this horrid ideal of slavery. But slavery in the Roman culture existed. And by most estimations, some 50 to 60% of the population of the Roman Empire were, in fact, slaves. That's huge, beloved. Some 60 million people being considered slaves in the height of the Roman Empire. In fact, the bulk of the population of the large cities, such as Corinth or Ephesus or Rome, were slaves. In fact, it may shock you, but remember, slaves were not just those who served households, but a slave could be a teacher, a medical doctor. A slave could be a business manager. And something else that people forget was that the bulk of slavery under in the biblical times and during this Roman Empire, the bulk of, of those who were slaves were imposed, self-imposed, the bulk, not all. Obviously, there were some horrors that existed in this time as well. But we have the luxuries in our society today of things such as filing bankruptcy. Now, I don't know that that should be called a luxury, right? But... Our debts can be just wiped away. For much of society before us, that was not the case. Debts couldn't just be whitewashed. They couldn't just be written off. I guess if you had a good godly debtor, it could be, right? And there are cases of that historically. But for the most part, when someone was in great debt to another, they would indenture themselves to that person or to those persons and become their slave until such a time that the debt was paid off. 
practice of slavery. You did not have to remain a slave your entire life. You could purchase your freedom. In fact, slaves during this time period, they could own property. In fact, if a husband, let's say, had to give himself as a slave, oftentimes he could keep his home and his family could still live as free people in the home. And the slave could sleep at his home with his family. It was not like the horrors of what we've come to understand as American slavery. It was much different. Still not ideal, obviously. And the Bible absolutely undermined the institution of slavery. In fact, when the gospel went forward, slavery was undone. And we have God to thank for that, amen? And the writers of Scripture thank God for them. But note here a few things that, and I guess we could call these parallels for us today. I don't know that we are slaves in the popular notion of such things, but, but we do work for others. Some of us are employees and some of us are employers. And so there are principles here that I believe that would apply to us. And just note what is said here. Again, he's not, he's not seeking to just destroy slavery in this letter. He's writing with another purpose. And the purpose is for us to be godly no matter serve God no matter if we're free people or slave people. It's bigger than that. Amen? And so he says, all who are under the yoke as slaves, you're to regard your own masters as worthy of all honor. And just like our bosses today. We should honor them. And so really there are two key things here we see as we display a godly attitude even in such an unwelcome situation as slavery or being an employee. I mean, I think everybody wants to be their own boss, right? I mean, that's, but many of us are not. And so how we treat those who are over us says a lot about what we believe about the Lord God. So we need to display this godly attitude. So to slaves with unslaved masters, he says, for the reputation of God in Christ, work as unto the Lord. We should all do that even today, amen? We don't just serve a company. We don't just have a boss, we serve the Lord. And that boss is in, a, is in a position of authority over us, amen? And so we should, as Christians, we should work as unto the Lord. You think about, when we think about slavery, I can't help but think about Joseph. His brothers sold him into slavery. And I don't think he volunteered and said, I want to be a slave. I'm not sure many people would do such things, but... He didn't pity himself because of his lot in life. He honored God even though he was a slave. And he did so to, to, such, to such extremes that the Lord elevated him to a position of influence in the household in which he found himself. Amen? And he honored the Lord. We see the same thing with Daniel, with Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, right? With those young men robbed from their families, taken to another country where they served as slaves. They did not wallow in self-pity for their position in life, but they served God right where they were. Folks, we can all learn to do such things, amen? And we are called to do such things. So if you have an unsaved boss, work as unto the Lord for the glory of God and ultimately for the good of the good of that company. Each of us could strive to do such things, amen? Secondly, he tells us in these first two verses that those who are slaves, Christian masters don't presume upon their Christianity. And I can't help but think about Philemon, Onesimus, the runaway slave. And how the slave owner is considered, or encouraged rather, to consider his faith and his new brother in Christ. And how they are to live as brothers serving the Lord together. Amen? Amen. It changes us. Sadly, that many of us may be immature in our faith or a state of sinfulness in that moment. Advantage of a boss who may be Christian. We think, oh, they're my brother. Maybe they even go to extra time at lunch because we're going to finish that, that Bible study we started before church, before work this morning. But if I'm on the clock, guess what that is? That's sinfulness, amen? I don't take advantage of a Christian boss 
just because we're Christians. I don't presume upon his Christianity. What do I do? I do the same thing I would do if I had an unsaved boss. I would work as unto the Lord. You see, the main idea here is that we're on display. Our godliness is on display whether we are master or slave or employer or employee. Christ is what matters, beloved. Amen? How we represent is what matters. No matter the in life. So the question is, do we represent Christ well, beloved? Do we represent Him well? Are we making the gospel attractive to others at work, including our boss? Do we start work on time? Do we only take our allotted break times? Do we punch out on time or do we punch out early? Or do we have someone punch out at the right time, but we leave early. All of those things are not the way Christians are to live. Amen? We're to honor the Lord. Our godliness should be on display. Secondly, we should display not just this godly attitude, but godly discernment. And this seems like a completely unrelated topic, but it's not. All of these things go together. And so notice what he says in verse 3. If anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the doctrine conforming to godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing. But he has a morbid interest in about words, which out of which arise envy, strife, and abusive language, and evil suspicion, constant friction between men of depraved mind and depraved, deprived of the truth. Those who suppose that godliness is a means that we're not teaching something differently. Not just not taking kindness and of Christianity from a boss, but that we're not sound doctrine, different doctrine. It, it's literally, it's this ideal of heterodoxy. We want to be orthodox. We want to teach the same truth that was passed down from the apostles. The orthodox, the faith, once and for all handed down. It doesn't change. It's not evolving with the times. Christianity should never adapt to the times. Christianity is the same truth that it was at the very beginning. Amen? It's the same truth, beloved. But we need to display godly discernment. So note, he says... A different doctrine. Again, that's heterodoxy. That's, that's strange or different. But we're to, to keep orthodox. The same faith once and for all handed down, as Jude says in verse 3 of his one chapter book. And he tells us that those who deviate are dangerous. They're known by their unsound words. The, the, the word here for unsound words, it's where we get like unhygienic, right? Being un, unhygienic. That's gross, right? It's nasty. That's the ideal here. We want to have hygienic words, hygienic way of life. We want to use discernment and not promote doctrine that conforms to godlessness. But it should conform to godliness. So our attitude, our discernment. And we, 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 we note in verse 4, those who, who would set this aside, they're conceited and they really understand nothing about the faith. We don't want to be like those people, beloved. Amen? We want to be... We want to make sure we conform to, again, the faith that was once and for all handed down. It's not evolving. It's not adapting. It's not changing. It's faith. And it works in any society. Any society. Any culture. The truth supersedes all such things. Teaching. We have to remember that truly godly teaching will produce truly godly living. It's not just for head knowledge. It's not just to win arguments, right? It's to change lives. A changed heart will lead to a changed life. At the end of the day, the question we should ask is, does this teaching, and again, we're not advocating this different doctrine, but one that, conf one that conforms to godliness, that's what we're looking for, so does this teaching, does this sermon, does this Bible study, does this TikTok or YouTube video or Instagram, whatever it might be, does this conform to sound doctrine? Does this encourage godliness? Does this cause me to be more like Jesus or does this make me more worldly? 
Much of Christianity is worldly today, so-called Christianity. It's about getting rich. The Lord just wants to bless you with money. We're going to answer that question here in just a moment. Is that true? But so much of Christianity focuses on all the benefits. And it wants those things without dying to self. It's not much different than Oprahism. In fact, but we need discernment. This helped me to conform to the image of Christ. This podcast is this really sanctifying me, or is this making me something otherly? Questions that we could all ask, and ask them about every every sermon here as well. Beyond this. So three things. Does this sermon, does this podcast, does this teaching humble the sinner or does it exalt the sinner? Much of Christianity today exalts the sinner. It does. It's all about what we get out of it. So does it humble the sinner? Does it honor the Lord Jesus Christ? Does it glory in Jesus? And thirdly, does it promote holiness? Every Bible study, every podcast, every Sunday school lesson should do at least one of those things. And it's helpful if it can do all of them, right? Humble the sinner, exalt the Savior, and lead to a sanctifying of our life. We're to be made more like Jesus, beloved. Amen? That's the goal, to be more like Jesus. And so in in, in verse 4, he's conceited and understands nothing. But he has a morbid interest in controversy. You ever met somebody that just likes to argue every little word? And in fact, let me just give you this little warning. Doing word studies. I think this was Peter. Was it Gaiman? Peter Gaiman? Uh, excellent, excellent theologian. Highly recommend him. G-O-E-M-A-N, I believe is how you say. Is it Goman? Gaiman? I forgot how you say his name. The Bible Sojourner. That's right. Excellent. I would highly recommend the Bible Sojourner. Great place to study. But I think he issued this warning this past week in one of his studies. Be careful doing word studies. A lot of us like to dig in and look at the word studies. A word study is great, but only as the word is used in context. Will that study help you or hurt you, right? You never forget the context. But I know people who like to argue over over such frivolous things, it seems like sometimes. They just like to win arguments. That doesn't help edify anybody. It leads to pride, and that's not what we're to be leading to. Amen? Does it humble me? Am I just trying to win arguments, or do I sincerely want the best for people? Am I just going to dispute over words? Now, there's a place for that, obviously. If people are twisting Scripture, we need to untwist it. Amen? We're called to do such things. But we need to be very careful that pride does not get in the way. The way of holiness is the way of Christ, and that is the way that, 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 that leads to the death of ourself. It's not my will, but your will be done. Amen? That's the goal. And so we need godly discernment so that we, we recognize whether something is helping us be more like Jesus or hurting us. And these men and women that Paul is warning Timothy about, remember he's having to address some problems with the elders of the church? He's having to get rid of some. Then he instructs him on how to find new ones. There's all sorts of issues because there are people. And where two or three together, there's problems, right? That's in second hesitations back here somewhere, I think. We need to be very careful. I know men and women that Paul was mentioning to Timothy, they, maybe they sought to impress with what they know, but what they had in vocabulary, they actually lacked in virtue. And the virtue is what really matters, beloved. We can say things, we can fake things, but the heart will ultimately reveal itself. How is our heart? How is our heart? In dealing with the workplace, godly discernment in dealing with those who bring strange, heterodox teachings. This last section, we need to display a godly contentment. And this is where it's all pushing. 
take care of those who are truly in need. And then he talked about honoring the elders, especially those who teach in securing them with payment, right, with compensation for their ministry. That's a biblical principle we talked about last week. And now he's tying all that back together with making sure that we have godly contentment. Look at verse 6. But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. You see, the wealth comes, but it's not necessarily financial that so many people emphasize today. The wealth is spiritual first and foremost, beloved. Amen? Riches beyond our bank accounts, beyond our 401ks, beyond our homes and our our sedans or our sports cars. The riches that we have are eternal riches in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 speaks to this. These spiritual blessings, how we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. The riches of His grace, amen? It's unfathomable. It's hard to put words to. But He's given us these things. And so godliness actually means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. It's not just about financial prosperity here. That's not what He's speaking to only. There's real treasure in godliness, And what he's saying is, people, open your eyes. Don't let your money own you. That's to tie in with last week as well, right? We should not allow our finances, our things to own us. But contentment, that's really the secret sauce of life. I don't know what the secret sauce is at McDonald's. I don't want to know. But the secret sauce of life is contentment. This I do know. We're to be satisfied with what we have, beloved. Amen? Sure, the Lord blesses. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I rejoice in much, I rejoice in little. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It's about Christ. That's the goal and I need to be content. Be content whether I'm a slave or a wealthy landowner. That's what's in context here. Right? No matter where my station in life is, the discontent one is always thinking of the next purchase, the next upgrade. It's always looking for the next iPhone, right? What's, which one's out now? The 16, the 27? I don't even know anymore. It's so hard to keep up. They've been coming out like But we're always looking for that next thing. The latest fashion. For our latest PS whatever it is now, right? We still use a Nintendo Switch. Shows you how hip we are. I would much rather play Mario Kart than El Diablo or whatever, right? Grand Theft Auto. Goodness gracious, the things we glory in. Are we always looking for a new car, a new truck? Godliness is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. Look at verse 7. He tells us why this is so important. For we have brought nothing into the world so we can take we cannot take anything out of it either All right i know i've shared this before you've heard it for years and it's, i can't really say it truthfully anymore because i have seen this but remember the old saying you never see a you a, tr- a hearse pulling a u-haul I, I i actually saw that one time <laughs> someone was living out of it and that's not the intent of the illustration obviously but i have seen it but that's not normative And the ideal is we don't take our stuff. And you know that. I mean, look at the tombs of pharaohs from years past. Buried with all of their riches. And there we still find the riches. And the pharaoh is long gone. You cannot take things with you. And yet we do so much to buy new things, to acclimate you know, new things, to store those things. We have to get bigger closets and bigger storage buildings to hold our bigger stuff. And we don't own stuff. We get to the point where the stuff owns us. That's not godliness, beloved. That's worldliness. And it needs to be repented of. We need to be very careful. If we can be very blunt this morning, we usually are. But greed makes you stupid. I don't know how to say it any plainer than that. I was looking at a number of different commentaries, and I went back to some of the, the older commentaries that, that, that we have record of, those who would 
might be what we would call in the public domain sphere today. And do you know, Terry, where someone, they didn't say it as, as crassly, I guess, as I did, that greed makes you stupid. But what they did say was, I like the word hippopotamus, ignoramus. I, I like those words. And that's a preacher that's been long dead and gone, some four or five hundred years now. But we have to be careful. We're born with nothing. We take nothing with us. Verse 8, if we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. Is that true of us? Is enough enough for us? Or are we always on the lookout for a score, trying to get more, trying to make a few extra dollars? And I'm not saying to take care of our bills. Are we more concerned with our 401ks than we are with the needs of those people in our congregation? That's something to consider, beloved. Amen? So verse 8 tells us then what this godly contentment looks like. If we have enough to provide for our needs, that's enough. That's what verse 8 is telling us. So again, our closet's full of stuff, our shed's full of stuff. We don't actually own the stuff. The stuff owns us. We are enslaved to stuff. There's another tie-in, this ideal of masters and slaves. Are we slaves to our belongings? How about maybe we think about something here? And I'm going to preach to myself for a second because as a man, I like tools. It's true. I like my cordless framing gun. I've used it on a few jobs. I think I've pretty much paid for it now with the jobs that I've used it on. But I had a perfectly good corded framing nailer before. And it got hard to add those extension cords and, you know, it got so long adding those cords, I was losing power. My nails weren't going all the way through, so then I was having to pick up an actual hammer that's just too much work. So I had to get the upgrade. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Okay. But maybe before we go buy a tool that we're going to use one time, maybe we, maybe we borrow it from somebody who's already got it. I've got a cordless framer if you need to borrow it. All right? Just throwing that out there. All right? But maybe we borrow instead of buy. Maybe we w- should become more generous in giving to others. Maybe and when someone comments on that book we just read, maybe we give it to them rather than put our name in the front and say, I need this back in two weeks or else. Maybe that's too personal as well. Because <laughs> right. not only do I like my tools, I like my books. You know that. But maybe we just start giving them away. I mean, how many times can you reread something? can reread it a lot, but, but maybe I give it to Shane next time, and then I borrow it when I want to read it again, right? Look at verse 9. We see a contrast here now. He says, but those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. Beloved, this To be discontent is sin. Now listen, being rich is not the issue. God blesses people with wealth. Praise God. That's not sinfulness. Money is not sinful. Look at verse 10. The love of money is the root of all sorts of evil, and some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Money is not sinful. It's the love of money that is the problem. Amen? So what's enough? And if you're like me, usually the more I get, the more I want. You have to get to a place where we say enough is enough, amen? We must learn contentment. Money is not evil. The love of money is what's wrong. Money is a tool that can be used for good or for evil. So if we're faithful with the things that God gives us, the Lord in His graciousness is able to bless us with more. 
that we may continue to be good stewards of it. Amen? Not for selfish gain. I can't help but think of Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 10. It says this, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with its income. This too is vanity. It's never enough. We're wired that way. So we should focus on godly things, good things, virtuous things, on God himself. If we want to continue to want and want and want, let's want and want and want more of God, amen? More humility, more peace, love, joy, all those fruit of the Spirit. Money will never be enough. There's always going to be the need for more if money is what brings us joy and happiness. It'll never fully satisfy. That's what God says. In Proverbs 30, verses 8 and 9, we read, Keep deception and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion, that I not be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or that I not be in want and steal and profane the name of my God. But have enough. Have my needs met. That's enough, beloved. Amen? That's enough. I have too much. I forget God. That's the problem of wealth. We can very easily become self-sufficient. But I know people who are very wealthy and they're very generous. Praise God. Amen? That's godliness. They're very generous with the things that they have. May we all be that way. Amen? No matter how wealthy we may think ourselves to be, we truly are wealthy in Christ. And you realize, I know we've shared this before, other times we've looked into these texts that deal with money. The poorest person in America is still one of the wealthiest people in the, in the world today. We have so much for which we can be thankful, beloved. Amen? May we be. May we be thankful. So, to summarize, my station in life really means nothing. I should live for the glory of God. Amen? And in doing so, I display that godly attitude. I use godly discernment to make sure what I'm hearing lines up with the word. And just a little key for you, usually if it's real popular, and if Oprah likes it, it's probably not godly. Just throwing that out there for you. It's probably not godly. But then I need to learn to be content. Godly contentment. Being satisfied with my station. Being satisfied with the stuff with what he's blessed us with, amen? And then using the stuff rather than letting the stuff use us. Using our, our things, using our finances for the good of our brothers and sisters in Christ, for the furthering of the gospel message of Jesus Christ. So why don't we support missions, beloved. So why don't we give away money. Could we use more money as a church? Yes. We talked about that last week. Absolutely, we could pay off the parking lot debt that we never intended to have, but the hurricanes came through and kind of messed our plan up. Of course, we would love to pay that off. Of course, we would love to be able to to pay all of our staff we talked about last week. Of course, but may we be good stewards with what he has given us, beloved. Amen? May we use the resources he has given us for the glory of God. 2 Corinthians 8 9. I'll leave you with this. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. You see, you, you could have billions of dollars. You could be na- named Bezos or or, or Gates, or, or Buffett's, whatever it might be, right? You could have billions of dollars, but not know Jesus. And when you die, you will leave everything to someone else. But if you know Christ, you have everything. And it will never be taken from us, beloved. Amen? Amen? So do you know Jesus? That's where true riches come from. Be rich in things that truly matter. Amen? 
and honor God with what he gives us and trust him to give us what we need. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your blessings. We do. And there are some here who are barely making it. There are others here who are very well off. And you are the same God. And you are good. And you are worthy of our praise, whether we have much or little. So may we be these kind of people, Lord. May we have the right attitude. May we use good discernment. And may we be a people that is that are content. May I be a person that is content with my place in life. And Lord, if there are any here today that do not know the blessedness of being called yours, of being found in Christ with a righteousness not of our own, but a righteousness given to us imputed into our account, placed into our account. God, may they come to know you today by grace through faith in Jesus with empty hands thrown up saying, we surrender. God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. And God, for those of us who do know you, oh, make us a content people. Father, may we recognize that our walk with you is ever on display. So may we be good stewards of the life that you have given us. We ask this in Christ Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. I appreciate your attentiveness.